The mystery disappearance of a well-loved man from the Midlands shocked his family. We soon realised that something serious had happened. His door hadn't been left ajar, it had actually been demolished. To all intents and purposes, it was as though he'd vanished off the face of the earth. The investigation into the case would lead to a gruesome find. We called in some specialists. The search was planned to last somewhere between five and seven days. And the peace of a rural community would be shattered forever. It's just not the sort of thing you expect in a quiet, peaceful Worcestershire village. No, no not our scene at all. But would the police ever get to the bottom of what had happened and track down those responsible for a callous and cold-blooded killing? There was no one to come forward and say they heard something, they saw something. There was something odd about this and, and you kind of knew in the pit of your stomach that something, gonna, something terrible had happened to him. Worcestershire, just 12 miles from Birmingham, lies the picturesque village of Alvechurch. Mentioned in the Doomsday Book, the parish has existed since the 8th century and is now a thriving community. We are a quintessential Worcestershire village. Uh, for those who um, maybe have to work um, in the towns, they can commute um, from Alvechurch and live somewhere where there's fields all around. It's a beautiful green oasis. A lot of people use it from, from the, the Midlands and they go out walking in that area. Um, so it's a, a real sort of picturesque place just to go and, and have a Sunday afternoon amble. There's all sorts of public footpaths as well and bridle pathways that go across the fields. Lots of farms on the outskirts of our church, so it is sort of semi-rural really. And it's not just the pretty Worcestershire countryside that the villagers of Alvechurch value. Our community spirit in Alvechurch is super. Because there's so many clubs and societies, I, I think there's three WIs, uh, there's the Historical Society, there's the Village Society. We've got a very good um, bell ringing group. So uh, whatever you're interested in, um, there'll be a society for you. Community spirit is to do with being part of a village and um, I think most people appreciate the fact that we have got a proper village here. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. There is a nice atmosphere uh, really around. Everyone seems to know each other and I've, I've been here all my life and uh, feel quite comfortable here. And it, it's uh, just, just the, general, the general feel of the place. It's just uh, generally a very pleasant place to be. But the peace and quiet of this rural idyll was shattered in August 2007, when the police swooped on a property just outside the village. The house itself was on a, uh, was on a, a country lane about a mile and a half outside of the village of Alf Church itself. Uh, the house stood alone, um, surrounded by fields. The nearest neighbour was probably uh, half a mile away. The police were looking for the body of a missing man, and intelligence had led them to a house next to a farm. The search was planned to last somewhere between five and seven days. We called in some specialists, a mixture of you know, forensic archaeologists with, with, with trowels lying on the ground and scooping an inch at a time of, of dirt away. Uh, to bring in JCB diggers to excavate larger parts of it far more quickly. So a whole mix of different methods that were used uh, in terms of being able to identify uh, where the body was. It was in a paddock behind the house that the forensic team made a discovery. We've been digging for a number of days and the forensic anthropologists found some bones. 
the anthropologist was very quickly able to say those are human bones and actually because of the bone type that it is it's from, it's from the hip it's a confirmation that actually the person who this bone belongs to is dead because you can't survive without that bone within your body Clearly the body had been in the burial pit for, for a number of years, it had been extensively burnt and quite considerable efforts had been made to make identification as difficult as possible. The grim discovery of a body buried in a pit sent shockwaves through the nearby village. Well it's certainly not the sort of thing we would expect in our church, it, you know, everybody was pretty upset about it. Um, it's just not the sort of thing you expect in a quiet, peaceful Worcestershire village, no, not, not our scene at all. Well, to hear about a body that's been buried, it is horrific. And I can recall hearing a limited amount on the television about a body being found buried in a garden. And um, that's really shocking. The police set about confirming the identity of the victim. And forensic work revealed the remains to be those of Andre Nunes, a 47-year-old man who'd been missing for two years. But we were able to recover teeth from, from, from there, which we were able to use to compare against his dental records, and that gave us a very positive confirmation that that was Andre. Police found Andre's body in, broken into hundreds of different parts. Um, it was difficult to tell how he'd been murdered just because of the sheer brutality that, that his body had been, uh, had been through. For the family, news that Andre's body had been discovered was a terrible blow. Our lives were turned upside down. The circumstances of his discovery were, were, were quite dark and devastating, basically. I just sort of felt a bit sick. <laughs> I wasn't sick, but I felt sick. There was nothing that I could do or anybody could do that was going to bring him back. It was a tragic loss for a family who had always been close. Andre Nunes wasn't from Alf Church. He'd gone missing from his hometown, nearby Birmingham. As a young man, Andre was outgoing and had a flair for fashion. Confident, he was good looking, he knew how to dress, he knew how to wear anything and make it look good. His dress was always meticulous and uh, smart. You know, I, I don't ever remember seeing him on the street looking shabby, ever. Um, he was always wearing like, pressed trousers, jacket, tie, shirt, cane. He always walked with his head high. In the late 70s, Andre moved to London and worked as a fashion model and choreographer. He was larger than life and he, he, he didn't question that. Nobody around him did. Um, so modelling just, I suppose it was, was a natural kind of progression. Despite Andre's charisma, talent and lust for life, during his time in London, his mental health declined. He moved back to Birmingham to be near his family and get help. He was much more introvert. He really didn't want to be out there partying. He stayed with mom and dad for a while and then got a flat uh, not too far away. Um, he was recovering from a breakdown and, as I say, he his whole world evolved around his flat. He didn't venture out much further than, than the, the perimeter of the estate on which um, he lived. Um, but he was still easily identifiable as Andre. He wouldn't um, party, he, wasn't, he wouldn't dance anymore. Um, but he still had a, a, a more quiet sense of humor. Um, and a calmness about him that was still quite appealing. 
So how had this well-liked creative man ended up buried in a pit behind a property near Alf Church? Could the police track down those responsible for Andre's death and would they be able to bring them to justice? We kind of knew that something terrible had, had, had happened to uh, Andre and the night he'd gone missing. August 2007, and West Midlands police had just discovered the body of 47-year-old Andre Noons, buried behind a property near the village of Alf Church in Worcestershire. His body had been buried in a pit, uh, and police had to use forensic archaeologists to slowly sieve away the layer upon layer of dirt to get to his remains. But Andre had gone missing from his home in Birmingham two years before, in September 2005. That Sunday afternoon, some of Andre's friends came round to visit him, found that the flat was open and empty, uh, and they called the police. He was missing, uh, there was no sign of a, a struggle or disturbance inside the flat, uh, but the front door had been forced open. We soon realised that something serious had happened. His door hadn't been left ajar, it had actually been demolished in the sense that somebody somebody broken in. It wasn't just the forced door that was a cause for concern. His um, mobile phone, his wallet, his personal possessions, the kind of possessions that you would take with you if you were going out were left behind. This had all the hallmarks of a kidnapping. He always carried a wallet with his passport in. When they told us that his flat had been broken into and his passport was still there, that caused huge alarm bells in our minds um, because it just wasn't Andre. West Midlands Police launched a missing persons inquiry to try and find out what had happened to Andre. From the outset, it, it, it seemed an incredibly strange and unusual case uh, because the door had clearly been forced open. Andre was missing, but none of his property was missing. Uh, and so the local detectives who began that initial investigation uh, took it very seriously, trying to piece together uh, Andre's movements, who he'd been with, who he'd been associated with, and who may have been to his flat either the night before or, 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 during, or during that morning. René Noons was also anxiously searching for his missing big brother. I would spend a lot of time driving around by Andre's looking for him. And I remember even going to the post office one day and asking them about Andre, because I knew he used to go to a post office nearby him. Of course, there was the possibility that Andre had left his flat of his own accord. And I remember trying to piece it together and make sense of what had gone on, and we decided that maybe he'd tired of this life, this phase of his life, and he just decided to take a change. And I think we probably hoped that that's what had happened. It could well have been that Andre decided that he wanted to go somewhere else and, and live his life somewhere else and had decided for, for his own personal reasons that he wanted to be apart from his family. In reality, deep down, everyone knew that wasn't the case because of the signs of forced entry to, to, his, to his property uh, and the fact he'd left his personal belongings behind. To all intents and purposes, it was as though he'd vanished off the face of the earth. The police made house-to-house -house inquiries on the estate where Andre lived, and this resulted in a lead for detectives. We got information about some people who'd been seen driving around the area afterwards, which, which, which seemed suspicious. <laughs> Officers tracked down three men and brought them in for questioning. The suspects wouldn't give any details about what had happened the night Andre disappeared, but police believed they weren't telling the whole truth. We always had an understanding that actually they knew far more than they, they were telling us. Uh, and so, but they were afraid. And in fact, some of our information coming to us was saying these, these three men had been intimidated, they had been threatened. 
Although detectives thought these men may have valuable information about what had happened to Andre, they weren't able to link them to his disappearance. Fortunately, detectives did have another lead in the case. It was reported that a red van had been seen in the area of, um, of Andre's flat around about the time he went missing, kind of in those hours beforehand. The police investigated this red van. Witnesses said it was possibly a Leyland DAF model or LDV. We were quite keen just to identify this van so we'd eliminate it from the inquiry. We spent a considerable amount of time trying to trace and identify uh, where this LDV van was and who we belonged to. That proved incredibly difficult. There are a large number of red LDV vans in the Birmingham area, and we, so we tried uh, to go and identify all of them so we could eliminate them all from the investigation. With the police struggling to identify the mystery red van and the three men refusing to tell police what they knew, the investigation into Andre's disappearance stalled. There was no one to come forward and say they heard something, they saw something. That was the real element of mystery to this case, that no one was able to give us an insight into the events of that night, the, the night of Andre's disappearance. The police were finding it difficult to make progress on the case, and Andre's family were missing their charismatic sibling, who back in his heyday as a model and choreographer, enjoyed being the centre of attention. He was always the star of the, of, the, of the family. He was always laughing, he always had great friends, always envied his friends, um, always went to great places, nice cars, um, everything he did just was something I envied. And I lived in his shadow, I just, um, but it was the kind of shadow that you didn't mind living in because it was almost so much fun. He loved dancing and he loved showing other people how to move. Of course, I learned to dance through him. He taught me a lot as regarding dancing in those days. I remember him as a, as a, um, a good brother. And, uh, you know, I wish he was still here. Back on the investigation into Andre's disappearance, months after he'd gone missing, the police were still no closer to finding out what had happened to him. In an attempt to move the investigation forward, they constructed a psychological profile. After the six months, we, we built up this, uh, the profile of Andre. We, we knew a lot about him and how, how he lived and his lifestyle and his friends and his family. And we knew the kind of things he did and he didn't do. And we knew he wasn't involved in any kind of criminality. But equally, we knew he wasn't the kind of individual who was just going to run off and disappear and, and hide himself. So I was able to form a conclusion that says that Andre hadn't voluntarily taken himself off, hadn't gone missing of his own accord. He had been taken against his will and therefore was almost certainly dead. The profile suggested Andre had been kidnapped and killed, and lack of activity in his bank account also added weight to their suspicions. It was at this point senior investigating officer Matthew Ward made a bold move. I made the decision to reclassify this as a murder investigation, uh, and what we call a no-body murder investigation because we hadn't been able to locate Andre. And it was at that point then that the case had gone from a missing person's potential kidnapping uh, to a murder, certainly within the eyes of the public. Um, that was a point where we were reporting for the first time that Andre was feared dead, had feared he'd been taken against his will and killed. It was really important at this stage uh, that actually we, we kept details about this case out there in the public domain. We wanted people talking about it, we wanted people thinking about it. With the police now classifying Andre's disappearance as murder and the press keeping the case in the public eye, the investigation finally started to move forward once more. Slowly, in a drip-by-drip drip fashion, we began to get snippets of names, and there were never partial names and first names and partial descriptions coming from a variety of different sources. The people who were living within the area, people living outside of the area who had heard things, started to pass us bits of information. And there was one name in particular, Michael Weldon, that rang bells with those in the know. 
Michael Weldon was a name that I came across routinely as a journalist covering certain areas of Birmingham. Uh, he was known as a as a hard man. Uh, I think he portrayed himself as a as a as a gangster, for want of a better word. Um, he was not a, not a man you, whose path you wanted to cross. Finally, more than six months after Andre had disappeared, the police had the name of a suspect. Could Michael Weldon be involved in Andre's disappearance and murder? And would the police be able to track down this notorious gangster? West Midlands police were trying to find those responsible for the kidnap and murder of Andre Noons. Now, months after he had disappeared, they finally had the name of a suspect, Michael Weldon. He was not a man whose path you wanted to cross. He was a man um, with a propensity towards violence that left people in fear of him. And an associate of Michael Weldon's, Mark Price, was also a name that was given up by local people. He was very much a, a petty criminal who had fallen into the influence of Michael Weldon had fallen into that, that lifestyle. The police spent many man hours piecing together information from house to house inquiries, a number of informants and anonymous tip offs. What we had to do as an investigative team was to bring all that together and actually try and build up a, a picture of what we thought had happened to Andre. And so we did build up bits that said actually there may be a, uh, somebody may have been killed and their body may have been buried in one location. Another bit of information suggests that somebody may have been kidnapped from this address. To another bit of information says it may be the case of mistaken identity. On their own, none of these could break the case for us. None of these were the complete answer. But by bringing them all together, we started to build up this picture of what we thought, we thought had happened to Andre. And the police hypothesis was that Andre may have been kidnapped and killed by Michael Weldon, Mark Price and others. Michael Weldon had a relative who was assaulted by her boyfriend. And the suspicion was that in the search for this man, the gang had ended up taking Andre, either because they thought he was the boyfriend or because they thought he knew where he was. Andre was not responsible for his kidnapping and his murder. Andre had done nothing that would have given anyone cause to take him. This was an innocent man who had been taken uh, against his will and, and kidnapped. The police now believed Andre to have been taken by these gangsters and killed, but they needed to find Andre's body to prove he'd been murdered. So we had this hypothesis and we started to get other bits of information which allowed us to identify where we thought the particular address the bones were buried were. The police identified the property near Alf Church as somewhere where Andre's body may have been buried. It was owned by Michael Oliver, an associate of Michael Weldon's. The police planned to raid the house and grounds in the hope of finally getting answers to the mystery of Andre's murder. So a lot of work went in terms of, you know, surveying the, the, the area in advance, aerial photography, so we understood the, the, the scale, the size of what we had to deal with. And Andre's family had now been waiting two years for concrete news about what had happened to him. This was the first time where they were going to get the answers. This was the first time where, if police found anything, if police found a body, this was final for them. I was hoping uh, against hope, as it were, you know, that I, I, I would see him again. On the 7th of August 2007, police raided Moorfields near Alf Church. We went along uh, early in the morning, uh, not too early, but uh, sort of about 8 o'clock one morning, uh, and it was done in a very sort of calm manner. We just knocked on the door. And within a couple of hours of them starting to search that house, uh, we found a, a, a stash of firearms uh, in the attic. It was a completely unexpected find. Uh, we found uh, two shotguns, a hanger, uh, and a, a stolen uh, army assault rifle, uh, which had been stolen some, some years earlier, uh, which had been, been hunted for for a large period of time. 
clearly the occupants were arrested for suspicion of possession of those illegal firearms. Michael Oliver was taken into custody, and while he was being interviewed under caution, forensic teams were looking at 20 areas around the house where they thought Andre's body might be buried. During one of those interviews, Michael Oliver indicated from the sites that we'd, we'd chosen which ones we should be looking at. What follows is the actual police video of Michael Oliver assisting officers with the hunt for Andre's body. Yes. So I think there's one here. Okay. It could be a couple of feet. So here or there. Is it inside the embankment? Would you, would you say it's before the embankment or actually under the embankment? Still, it was filled in. You know, the forensic team set about digging in the area indicated by Michael Oliver. Very challenging operation. Uh, a lot of effort went, went into it by, by the teams who, who, who were doing it. Uh, and, and, you know, it was painstaking, we, we slow at times, but it had to be methodical and thorough in terms of the approach that we took. That's where we found Andre's remains. Michael Oliver told the police that two years previously, Michael Weldon had persuaded him to use his land to dispose of a body. Michael Oliver told us that he didn't know it was the body of Andre Nunes. He'd been told it was a paedophile that Weldon had killed. But he was present when that fire was lit and the body was placed into that grave. Forensics revealed the extent to which the gang had gone to dispose of Andre's body and try to destroy the evidence. First of all, they killed him, and then they burnt his body, but then they'd broken his body in, into, into bits. Uh, they shattered his bones. Um, it's the most shocking way you could possibly imagine that someone could, could deal with another human being. I said to myself, you know, I'm, I, I won't stop believing that I'm going to see my brother again unless I have evidence to the contrary. And, of course, when, when his uh, uh, body was, or what was left of him, was um, unearthed, then that, that, that was it, really. You know, of course, you started thinking, had he been harmed prior to his death or was this an, an attempt to kind of hide the, the murder um, or you know had he had he had he suffered had had they done anything to him prior to him actually losing his life within the burial pit itself where Andre's body was found uh, there, there were fragments of clothing which had been burnt which still left parts of jeans or possibly maybe a bit of a blanket which may have been used to to, to wrap him in Let's go through and then you can show me. The remains in the pit weren't the only things unearthed at the property. Michael Oliver revealed to police there was more to be found on his land. In the bushes. You're indicating over there towards oh, the paddocks. Yeah. Is that by the yeah. white tent? By the white tent. OK, and what do we expect to find when we're over there? It should be a watch over there. Now, I don't know if it belonged to the gentleman that you found in there. I just got thrown it and says it belongs to the man. That was it. Okay. And the description of the watch that we're looking for? It's a big chunky one. Forensics located the watch a short distance away from the body, and it turned out to be Andre's. Michael Oliver confessed to police that he'd kept it for a reason. He says he, he placed it there as insurance against Weldon as evidence that he would have on Weldon, that Weldon and he had been involved in burying this body. Michael Oliver was confirming what the police thought all along, that it was Weldon and his associates that had kidnapped and murdered Andre. As the news of the discovery of Andre's body hit the local media, the police decided to monitor their prime suspects. As part of the investigation, we carried out uh, surveillance on them to understand where they were going, who they were associated with. 
Were they reacting to anything they were seeing in the media? Were they making contact with any of the other suspects that we believe were involved in this uh, to try and actually just build up that bigger picture of them, their lifestyles and what they were doing? The gang didn't alter their behaviour, but the publicity surrounding the discovery of Andre's body did prompt a reaction from someone. One of the three men who'd refused to talk to police at the start of the investigation now came forward. One of those three men did eventually break down uh, and in floods of tears began to tell us what had actually gone on. Uh, I think he found it a great sense of relief to, to, to get off his chest what he knew. The witness admitted he was there when Michael Weldon came looking for the man who assaulted his relative and that the witness had taken Weldon to Andre's flat. That gave us the, the evidential link that said Michael Walden was there, seen just before Andre Nunes disappeared, walking towards the flat with a firearm. Now, with witness evidence placing Michael Weldon at both the scene of Andre's kidnap and the disposal of his body, the police charged him with kidnap and murder. Mark Price was arrested days later, and when he was picked out of an identity parade by the witnesses, he too was charged with kidnap and murder. And having admitted to being present when Andre's body was burned and buried, Michael Oliver was charged with perverting the course of justice and firearms offences. But it was only when the case went to court in June 2008 that the full story of what had happened to Andre would finally be revealed. Perhaps the most difficult thing for the family was having to sit there in court day after day listening to the circumstances in which Andre I was kidnapped and murdered. June 2008, and at Birmingham Crown Court, Michael Weldon and Mark Price stood trial for the kidnap and murder of Andre Noons. Their associate Michael Oliver was facing the charges of perverting the course of justice and possession of illegal firearms. It was a difficult court case to sit through just because of the horrific nature of, of how Andre met his fate and the seemingly trivial nature of how his killers had ended up at his front door and ended up taking him. The court case just seemed a bit sort of strange, a bit sort of macabre as well, sort of coming face to face with someone that you, you, you were told murdered your brother. The prosecution had persuaded the terrified witnesses and others to tell the court what they knew, and so set out their case of what had happened the night Andre went missing. The circumstances of that night are shocking, to say the least. Um, Michael Weldon was seeking retribution for a perceived slight that had happened to one of his relatives who had been slapped across the face during a night out in, in Birmingham and Weldon was after that person um, to take retribution. On the night that Andre died, Weldon, along with three other men, including Price, equipped themselves with firearms and shotguns. They got into his grey Volvo car uh, and they drove to a girl that he knew who he believes she may know where this boyfriend is. When they got to the girl's address, she wasn't there on her own. She had three young men with her. Uh, they were having a, a bit of a party at the house. Get back. Get in there. Get in, get in. What do you want? Come on. Where is it? She said to Weldon, she doesn't know where this boyfriend is, but one of these three men may do so. You know him. Come on. Him. Walton was irate, he was angry, he was he, he was shouting. You know you know him. The young men were particularly frightened by him. One attempted to get out of the flat by running out of the back door, but as they'd done so, one of Walton's henchmen was stood outside. Where are you going? Me. Back here. Go. So they were trapped inside this flat with Walden, who was screaming at them. He wanted to know where this boyfriend was. And one of these three young men uh, agreed to, to, to take uh, Walden and his henchmen to where for the boyfriend may be, uh, which was Andre Noon's flat. So the three young men were left in their vehicle, followed by Walden and his three henchmen. 
they'd seen this gentleman at Andre Nunes' flat on an occasion. It's quite possible Andre Nunes knew this gentleman as an acquaintance, only probably wasn't even good friends with him. But the only way they could save themselves was take Michael Weldon and his cohorts to Andre's flat. When they got to the location, Weldon and his henchmen got out. The three young men saw them taking out weapons, loading weapons, loading shotguns, and then they told the three young men to leave the area whilst they went to go to Andre Noon's flat. It was at that point that Michael Weldon and the other men forced their way into Andre's flat. Hey, get in! Get up in there! Get in! 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 From bits of information that we picked up, the suggestion was that they didn't know what the boyfriend looked like, they didn't know what Noons looked like, and, and they got Noons by mistake uh, trying to get the boyfriend instead. Andre would never have seen this coming. This was not something Andre had been involved in. It's not something that Andre probably even knew about. Andre was bundled into the car at gunpoint and he was driven away. It's not me. It's not me. They took Noons and whether they realised they made a mistake or Noons wasn't prepared to tell them where the boyfriend was, for one reason or another, only they know they chose to, to, to kill Noons. As Andre's body had been burnt and broken into bits, it was impossible for forensics to say exactly how he died. But the police had a theory. We don't know how they killed him, uh, but again, the hypothesis is that they probably shot him. And then they decided they needed to get rid of the body. Firstly, we believe they took him to Mark Price's address where they cleaned themselves up, uh, and then they took the body to, to an address in Alf Church where they arranged for it to be burnt. I hope that my brother died quickly um, because the other alternatives that I've considered in my mind, I've thought, you know, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. What the forensic team had pieced together was the barbaric way they treated Andre's body once he was dead and how Weldon and Price tried to cover their tracks. They were obviously trying to find a way of of disposing of, of Andre's remains in a way that would perhaps not give any evidence, not lead police to their doorstep. The jury heard how Andre's shocking kidnap and murder was motivated by nothing more than Michael Weldon's overwhelming desire for revenge. You struggle to understand how one human being could, could behave in another way and is willing to take the, the, the ultimate sanction of murdering somebody for what was a seemingly trivial incident. But that's the kind of person Michael Weldon was. He ruled by fear. He couldn't have uh, a member of his family slighted in such a way. He's standing in the community, you know, rested on the fact that he was going to take some retribution. But Weldon and Price denied the charges against them. Throughout the trial, both Weldon and Price uh, maintained their innocence. They pleaded not guilty to it. Um, they were hoping, I were, I'm sure, that, that there would be enough of a, of a reasonable doubt uh, in the jury's mind to allow them to walk free. Michael Weldon claimed he was aware that his relative had been assaulted, but he hadn't sought revenge. He was satisfied the police had dealt with that, uh, and therefore he, he never went looking for anybody and says he wasn't equipped with any firearms or kidnapped or killed anybody. He admitted he did go to the, uh, the Oliver's address, uh, but when he got there, a fire was already burning, and the Oliver's told them that they, 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 the horse had died and they were destroying its remains. The defence team also tried to smear Andre's good name by saying he was involved in drug dealing. What shocked us, shocked us beyond anything was was some of the some of the stories they made up about Andre and his life that just 
had no grounding in reality at all. They tried to paint a picture of someone who, who just we'd, we'd never heard of. We, we had no idea who this person was, but obviously by, by demonising him, their actions would seem less demonic. Despite the defence trying to discredit André, the jury believed the prosecution's version of events, and all three defendants were found guilty. Weldon and Price for kidnap and murder and perverting the course of justice, and Oliver for perverting the course of justice and firearms offences. They were jailed for life. That's the end of their life. For me, I kind of felt it was you know, justice done that these men were finally jailed for his murder. I can't actually think of them with any with any kind of feeling. I have no feeling, you know, they don't... I think I might... You might get a rise out of me if, if I thought that they might be um, let, let out. But there is no feeling for them whatsoever. But what was never identified during the two-year investigation was the red van spotted the night Andre disappeared. It still, to this day, remains a mystery um, who that red van belonged to, what it was doing in the area, uh, and it potentially never had anything to do with Andre's disappearance. However, we'll, we'll never know. Sentencing Weldon to a minimum term of 23 years in prison and Price and Oliver to 15 years each, the judge commented that this was a callous and cold-blooded killing. The tragedy of this one was that, you know, he, he was completely blameless of, 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 any, of, of any wrongdoing. It was unfortunate that uh, uh, the people who came looking for him were irate, you know, lost all s sense of self-control, were desperate to prove a point, and in the end, they couldn't care less who they proved that point with, even if it cost somebody their life. And for the villagers of Alvechurch, there was comfort in knowing that these dangerous men were now safely behind bars. These chaps have had uh, what's coming to them in a way, and uh, that they're in prison and it's they're, they're serving their time. You know. well, at least if, if someone's been convicted of the murder, somebody has been brought to justice, which is, is perhaps a relief in some respects, but um, it's still altogether a very unpleasant subject, isn't it? But for Andre's family, what's important for them is remembering their brother as a fun-loving, creative and gifted man. Last year I was invited to a 70s disco and it was, I felt that every single song was a song that, that I remembered Andre dancing to. You know, music, um, having fun. That's how I'd like him to be remembered. Someone who, someone who didn't waste what he'd been given, but tried to make the most of it. He helped build my character. He helped build the character of my children. Um, and for that, he will never be forgotten. That was the last in the series, but you can catch up with any you missed all day tomorrow from 9am through to 7 and don't forget, there's brand new Double Trouble later tomorrow night from 9. We hear from a girl who 